Our reading for today, we're starting in Luke 6.33 and going through to Luke 7.10. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap, but with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes, or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my word and puts them not into practice. He is like a man building a house, who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it, because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. When Jesus had finished saying this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some of the elders to the, of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves that you have to do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve that you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. That one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. The words of the Lord, thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask, Lord, that you'll let it shape us this morning, that we might be like you and give you glory. Amen. The winter of 1912 was the mildest winter in 30 years, and the result of that was that large icebergs were breaking off the glaciers of Greenland, and unusually strong winds were pushing them south into the shipping lanes across the North Atlantic. The Hydrographic Office in Washington, D.C., requested captains to make use 
of the United States Naval Radio Stations for the purpose of reporting ice and other dangers to navigation. Now, you need to remember that wireless communication radio was brand new at the time. It was the latest and greatest thing. The White Star shipping line did have Marconi wireless telegraph operators on it, but they were not considered part of the crew. They were employed by the Marconi company, not the White Star line. Their priority was to send and receive messages from passengers who paid handsomely for that novel privilege. And so there was no established procedure between this newfangled radio room and the bridge where the captain or the officer in charge would control the ship from and to handle any ice warnings in a cooperative way between the two. On April 14th, the day of the disaster, which I think we all know, the Titanic received seven iceberg warnings. One of these messages was transmitted from the SS America to the Titanic. The message reported ice along the Titanic's route. The Titanic radio operators retransmitted that message, forwarding it on to the hydrographic office in Washington. They sent that message thousands of miles across the sea, but what they didn't do was send it a few metres away to the bridge of the Titanic. Later, the hydrographic, hydrographic office would state in its report on the sinking of the Titanic the irony that the Titanic hit an iceberg that she herself had reported. The report actually said, it is a lamentable fact and a remarkable coincidence that the sinking of the Titanic was caused by an iceberg, the report of which she had transmitted. Had she but heeded that one warning that she transmitted, she would probably have saved herself. The disaster hearings also discovered that an important ice warning message was received approximately one hour before the collision. The SS Californian, on the same route as the Titanic, stopped due to ice warnings, and they in turn warned the Titanic as well. The operator that received this message from the SS Californian said this, quote, shut up, stop, I am busy, stop, I am working. You see, his focus was on sending and receiving messages to make money for the Marconi radio company. The warnings were heard, but there was no process whereby they were assessed and then responded to with an action that would result in safety. There is an almost constant process within us of information coming in, often heard, and then this information is processed in some way, whether well or poorly, and then the next thing is that there is some response or action that takes place or perhaps the response is not to respond and there's no action based on how that information was processed and then finally there is a result 
And that result is invariably revealed. And at the end, this is what I want us to add some detail to underneath those points. In the case of the Titanic, information came in. In fact, seven warnings were given, but it was not at all processed property. This meant that no action was taken. And the result that was clearly revealed to the world was the tragic loss of 1,517 lives. The process is important, is it not? This process is happening all around us. It's happening within us all the time. So much so that we don't even think about it. And that is what I think is the problem, that we're not thinking about the process. But I want us to think about it today. As we see this process outlined by Jesus here in the scripture that Keith just read to us. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does the bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its fruit. The good man brings good things out of the good that's been stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Be good if you have your Bibles open there. Chapter 6 from verse 43. But before that good or evil fruit gets revealed over here, there is a process, isn't there? There's a process of storing up in the heart. There is an input of information that is assessed and then stored. There is a reflection, a discerning, a recognising that this is valuable, this is important, a process of deciding that this is good or this is bad. I will store this up. I won't store that up. According to Jesus in this passage, which is a well-known phrase that we say quite often, if we let garbage in to reside in our heart, the fruit is going to be bad. We all know garbage in, garbage out. The result will be that your fruit, that is who you are and what comes out of you in terms of your speech and your action, will either bless those around you or it will frustrate them or perhaps even worse. With such consequences we need to ask am I evaluating the value of the media of the stuff that I am consuming does it have any quality is it feeding me is it informing me is it making me better is it worth storing or is it not? Or do I care to make that assessment? Look, I know there's times you just got to zone out, right? Sunday night, I get home about quarter to ten. I just had a, <laughs> had a big day. You know, this, you're not always, you know, reading encyclopedias, but you know what I mean, right? Or the Bible. And the result is invariably revealed because we see here the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Have you ever been in that situation, I wonder, where you're having a great time bagging someone out, as we do, you know? They said that, oh, yeah, they did that, or, oh, fancy that, yeah, how could they? I can't believe it. And we, we get into that, don't we? Only to discover... 
that the person you're talking about has overheard you. That happened. Perhaps they're in the next room and you didn't realise. Perhaps, you know, you thought you, you, you cancelled the call, but the phone's still going. <laughs> that happens, doesn't it? How did that go down? Or perhaps you were the person actually hearing the person's true feelings about you. I've been in that situation. Not very nice. The mouth reveals what is in the heart and sometimes the truth of the heart will come out, often to our embarrassment. And we see this same principle in Jesus' next parable about the two builders. Jesus begins in verse 46 by asking a question that applies to this process of what we do with what we hear him say. And so he asks that question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So the information was heard, but there was no reflection or response and therefore no result. You can keep that slide, that slide three or whatever it was up there, was sort of repeating those things. Jesus highlights the different results between good listening and a bad listening process. The person who listens is like a man building a house who dug down deep, laid the foundation of his house on rock. But what had happened there? Well, at some point in that man's life, he heard. He was taught or something. It came, the information came, that it's really important to build on a solid foundation. That came in. But he didn't just leave that information there. What he did then was reflect on it. And as he reflected, something happened. He then understood the importance of that information built on the rock. And in that process of reflection, he recognised the ongoing benefits of a solid foundation. It's going to last. But then more than that, it changed him. The information, the reflection, and now he's changed because now he's prepared to act on that appreciation of the value by doing the hard work, digging down deep, the time, cost and effort that required, he was prepared to put that in. And so when the flood comes, as it will, we all know, we've, been, we've all been through a few, next month, next year, five years, when the stress is put on that structure, the result is that it will stand firm. The result is revealed for all to see that this man and his family were safe. Despite the flood, they had somewhere to go back to. They had a roof over their head. They were protected. They were blessed. He listened. He reflected on the value and the importance of what he heard. He knew it was worth doing. That changed him. Then he acted in accordance with that information that changed his attitude and he made the effort and dug deeper. So he responded very practically with a shovel and hard work until he reached that foundation of rock. And then as the torrent came later, the result of that effort, that whole process, 
was revealed for all to see. Jesus says in verse 47 that that is what it's like for anyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. See the process there. We come to Jesus. How do we do that? Well, we come in humility and we recognize him as my Lord, as as my King. We come to appreciate the enormous price that he paid in his sacrificial death because of his great love. And we let that change us. See, if we haven't come to him, we can't even turn the first sod. And then hearing Jesus' words, the reflection process begins. And it might go like this. Jesus is the source of those words. Therefore, they are priceless. In fact, Jesus says they're of eternal value. They're going to outlast the earth, his words. Therefore, these words need to be really important to me. It might also factor in that Jesus loves me enormously. So if I respond to his words in the right way, it's going to bless me because he wants good for me. He loves me. Therefore, I will let Jesus' words change me, change my heart, change my values, change my attitudes, and then I'll be more like Jesus wants me to be. And then after that reflection, we respond in some way in obedience by building on that foundation of Jesus with appropriate action toward him and toward the other people in my life, doing what he said. And what did he say? We looked at them last week. Keith reiterated again, love your enemies. As Maddie said, being a Christian is hard work. Forgive. Be generous to others. Do to others you would have them do to you. And then the result of that response is going to be revealed in the fruit that you will bear, in the words that you say, the prayers that you pray, the things that you do. And those things will be a blessing to you and to those around you. But on the other hand, if you hear my words, and even if you say, Lord, Lord, and you go around wanting to remove specks in people's eyes everywhere without letting the words change you. Or if you only do those things at a superficial level for others to see while your heart remains bad, what you're doing is laying bricks on grass. Crazy. Nothing underneath, nothing solid. As you know, well, as I know, we all know, but as a builder, you've you got to go down before you start going up. First thing the builder does is come in, sit out, starts digging, not putting up the frame. You've got to dig. If that's the case, if you're laying your bricks on grass, it's only a matter of time because sooner or later that fruit is going to be revealed. Your house is going to collapse and it's probably not just going to damage or destroy you. Invariably, there is collateral damage to those closest to you. But even more, we see the implication there uh, of complete destruction at the end of verse 49 is that You'll also miss out 
when God calls his loved ones home. You won't be one of them because there was no response. And yet over the years, I've seen so many people that I have listened to, I have spoken with, I've provided resources to, I've provided referrals to, I've read the Bible with, I've prayed with, I've cried with. And I'm sure we've all done that. They have heard, they have been informed, but for whatever reason, they have not processed they have not valued the word, they have not responded, they have not changed, but sadly, they did get a result. Not the one they wanted. So this is a powerful warning, is it not, that Jesus is giving us about what's at stake in this process, listening, reflection, storing up good things, changing our heart and then responding in action with a result that is visible. You might want to just reflect on the last storm that hit your life. What did you learn about the process? What did you learn about your foundation? And in a sense, this account of the centurion that follows in chapter 7 is a real-life example of this, not just a parable. Um, yet in many ways, this centurion would be the least likely example. He was an officer in the army that had invaded and was now occupying Israel. Essentially, he was their enemy. He would be considered to be a dirty Gentile by these people, raised, probably raised as a pagan worshipping Roman gods. That's who he was. But at the very same time, and now, this man was compassionate toward his servant that he valued highly. He was incredibly humble and sensitive Values not esteemed in Roman culture at all. But he was incredibly humble and sensitive to get involved and appreciate the culture of the people that he was now governing. So much so that this enemy officer was described here by the Jews as loving their nation. And he even built them their synagogue. I don't know, possibly, you know, he could access some, you know, Roman grant and uh, capital grant and maybe he got some of, the, some of the lads, the soldiers to help out in the construction process. But it's most likely he paid for it himself. Would have been very costly. This century, century may have been what we call a God-fearer. That is a Gentile who has come to recognise and who follows the Lord and yet does not go through the, um, let's say, eye-watering process required to become a Jew. He's a fascinating person, isn't he? In verse 3, we see that he has heard about Jesus. He has heard that Jesus must be saying some amazing things, crazy things like love your enemy. Uh, he's heard that Jesus... Obviously, he's heard that Jesus is doing amazing things like healing people, driving out demons, and that people are following him. This guy gets the fact that Jesus' teaching has authority, and he's exercising that authority over disease, disability, over demons, over nature. And because he recognises that in his reflection process after getting that information, he then asks the elders of the Jews in Capernaum to go and ask Jesus if he will come and heal his servant. Now that was going to be really awkward. I think it's 
the, the dynamic here is, is it's fascinating. See, not long before, when Jesus had healed the paralyzed man in Capernaum, the teachers of the law were there and they said, ah, oh, Jesus, he's a blasphemer. How can he claim to forgive sin? When Jesus ate with Matthew, the tax collector, and all his sinful mates in Capernaum, they didn't like that at all. How dare he? And neither did they like it when the man that Jesus healed on the Sabbath with a withered hand in the synagogue that this Roman centurion may well have built. They didn't like that. In fact, in Mark's account of that, in chapter 3 in Mark, after that they plotted to kill him. Now the centurion asked them to go to Jesus and ask him to come and heal his servant. They had to because this guy had been so amazingly gracious and generous to them. But I bet they did it with gritted teeth and red faces. See, the centurion had heard just a little about Jesus and he began this reflection process of what he heard he understood the great authority and the power that Jesus could do these amazing things. And it would appear that he understood that that authority that Jesus had came from the God that it seems he had come to know and follow. And so he responds to that understanding of who Jesus is by acting in faith to ask the Jews for help. And that's pretty amazing. No wonder Jesus commended him for his faith. But the sad irony here is that this Roman Gentile occupier and the Jews heard the very same things about Jesus, but even more, the Jews saw some of these miracles. Yet it was the centurion who recognised Jesus' authority and responded in faith. Well, the Jewish leaders, by and large, as we know, rejected him. The revealed result was healing and blessing for that servant and the centurion. Liz and I uh, recently listened to an audio book called The Athlete Inside, driving uh, back and forwards to uh, Victoria, as we did recently. It's the amazing story of Sue Reynolds, who, at the age of 60 and weighing 335 pounds, which I think is about over 150 kilos, one day decided to do something about it. And so as you do, she decided to become a triathlete. <laughs> she became the first American and the sixth person over the line in the world championship in her age group. It's a, it's a great story, but it's also about her spiritual journey. And perhaps what I found uh, more amazing than her, her fitness regime was the fact that at the age of 60 and going to church virtually all her life, she barely knew how to find a chapter and a verse in the book of the Bible. And I thought, how could that possibly be? For decades, she had heard but not listened. She had heard but not reflected or responded. And the result in terms of her walk with the Lord was that it 
virtually didn't exist. I found that amazing, yet as I reflected on that, there are so many people, so many family and friends that I know that who have heard the word of God week in, week out, and it made no difference to them either. And so many of them have drifted off. I realised hearing without reflecting and responding and therefore having no result or a negative result is tragically not as rare as you might expect. The information came into that wireless operator on the Titanic. He clearly heard it. In fact, he retransmitted it. He shared the message with others. But it didn't get to where it had to go, to the captain on the bridge, for a correct response to be made that was going to have a beneficial result. One man heard and he chose good things to store up in his heart and those good things came out and blessed others. The other man didn't choose or perhaps he chose poorly about what he took in and stored up and therefore evil came out. One builder listened, he reflected and he valued what he heard. He realised the importance, it made a difference, it changed him, his attitude to work and so he worked to provide a safe house for his family. The other heard, he knew that rock was a good foundation but he thought, yeah, whatever. He didn't appreciate the importance or let it affect him. And the result was disaster and embarrassment. The centurion heard, reflected, realised, acted and was blessed. So I want us to think about this process because it is so important to think about how we respond to Jesus' words in practical terms.